Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego is about to be created a cardinal by Pope Francis. However, McElroy was the key player in covering up a satanic ritual abuse at Mass involving desecration of the Blessed Sacrament by one of his priests. In order to cover it all up, he lied to the diocese, he lied to investigators, and he stonewalled law enforcement, all to keep secret sexual abuse of a virgin by one of his priests dedicated to worship of Satan. In this special report, Christine Niles exposes the dark details and asks how such a man could be elevated to the College of Cardinals and should this information prevent his elevation. must say yes. And I don't like that he's holding my hand right now, but this is my duty. And so right there in front of Jesus, the image of Jesus in his sacred heart, I said, yes, I trust you. And that was the beginning of him starting to touch me. Now to a developing story. This San Diego priest right here now facing charges in Minnesota. Father in 2016, Father Jacob Bertrand was charged with criminal sexual conduct after taking advantage of a woman during mass in Minnesota. Minnesota is among about a dozen states that treat this as a crime. But anytime a member of the clergy is involved in a situation where they're giving uh, spiritual advice or comfort or aid to someone that they are prohibited by law while that is going on to have a sexual contact with that person. I was open to religious life. I also was hopeful of maybe finding a spouse. Um, and I just wanted to be in the center of God's will. So I moved to Rome and almost immediately um, Bertrand spotted me at the end. The predation actually began immediately. In 2009, Rachel Mastro Giacomo was a young student at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome, also known as the Angelicum. There, she met 26-year-old Jacob Bertrand, a fourth-year student at the Angelicum, who was living and studying at the North American College, known as the NAC. It's home to an elite band of men sent from dioceses all over the U.S. to study for the priesthood who are then sent back to the U.S. and often gain influential positions. So when he started to escort me throughout Rome, showing me this place, showing me that place, always out in the open, always out, you know, in the light, walking around churches, this, that, and the other, it just felt like, okay, thanks be to God. There's a clergyman, a man of God, someone that I can trust, and, you know, I, I feel more safe rather than walking alone. Bertrand quickly gained Rachel's trust, playing a protective fatherly role, assuring her he'd be praying for her vocation and making her feel safe. But things soon took a dark turn. He took me to the fifth floor of the North American College. Um, I think we went to this terrace and so we overlooked, you know, we were looking at the Vatican and then he brought me inside into this room. It was all very public. I mean, this was totally safe, but he came back and he said, he said, I want you to read my journals. And he said, I feel the Holy Spirit is calling me to tell you a little bit about my past. And I was like, oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit is doing something. And I, you know, I had been so charismatic She's referring to the charismatic movement, known for its devotion to the Holy Spirit, Eucharistic adoration, and belief in divine healings. And um, unfortunately, he used all of that against me. He began to reveal his sexual past and asked her to open up to him. Only years later would Rachel realize what specific detail he was fishing for. I just thought he was being vulnerable. And... Um, 
I, I saw it as an opportunity to reflect on the church's teaching on chastity. And I, I also saw it as an opportunity to bear witness, you know, and say, look, by God's grace, I, I'm actually still a virgin. So I shared this information with him. And uh, that's precisely the information he was looking for. I Rachel's virginity was key for Bertrand's purposes. He persuaded her to let him be her spiritual director. He used his role to convince her she had a religious calling, that they were meant to be mystically espoused, like Joseph and Mary, and that Rachel was destined to be the mother of many future priests. It culminated in a, quote, spiritual proposal on February 20th, 2010, in the Church of the Jesu, a place Rachel had spent much time in prayer, sometimes up to five hours a day. This is a very, very sacred space for me because it was the place that I had been begging God for the fulfillment of my vocation. And so here we are right in front of the image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And, um, and Bertrand looks to me and he says, you know, do you trust me? And um, this completely caught me off guard, but he held my hand and it was actually so gross to me in that moment. I felt so um, disgusted by him, but I felt that I had to, um, I had to obey that this was more of a spiritual uh, invitation into obedience. And um, this had nothing to do with um, an ordinary kind of courtship. This was my duty. And so I must I must say yes. And I don't like that he's holding my hand right now, but this is my duty. And so right there in front of Jesus, the image of Jesus in his sacred heart, I said, yes, I trust you. And that was the beginning of him starting to touch me. After that, Bertrand made a habit of holding her hand including during spiritual direction. I was so grossed out. <laughs> ah. I was so grossed out and I just, I just let him continue to do it and I got used to it. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the beginning of the sexual grooming. That's the reality of it. Rachel was the perfect target, young, pious, with a genuine yearning for holiness and a blind trust in clergy. She had lost her father at age 13, a devastating event that left a void she sought to fill through her spiritual fathers, priests. She was blessed to meet a number of clergy who were good men, and so she believed all priests must be good, only concerned for the salvation of souls. She went to Rome with this same naive trust. Bertrand started to say things that my gut instinct was like, that's really off. But who am I? Who am I to challenge a, a, a man of God, you know, um, a cleric? Uh, I, I would not know better than him. And so I actually um, trusted their words over my own instincts. I invite you to take. It was thus Bertrand was able to start sexualizing their relationship but always within the context of the spiritual. On one occasion, after adoration, he shared with her that he had a vision of her naked, straddling him. They would have to wait to see what that vision meant. People hear this and they're like, how could you not have known? And I, I it's excruciating for me to revisit this and even ask myself, how could I not have known But there had been so much grooming at that point? So when he said that, I didn't even think that he was talking about anything sexual. In the summer of 2010, Rachel traveled with Bertrand to his ordination in San Diego. He afterwards persuaded her they needed to consummate their spiritual union. It was so calculated and it was so slow and it was all about Jesus. It was all about um, my vocation and my calling to be the special bride of Christ. 
As with many predators, Bertrand ingratiated himself with Rachel's family, who lived in Minnesota, charming them during visits, gaining their trust, offering private masses in their home, hearing their confessions. It was, in fact, first in the cabin of Rachel's grandmother, and then in the basement of her family home in Minnesota on July 9, 2010, that he would offer the holy sacrifice of the mass, during which he sexually assaulted Rachel. The details are disturbing. Those with sensitivities may wish to fast forward through the next few minutes. From the 2016 criminal complaint, during this private mass, Bertrand again wore his stole and had candles burning. During this mass, the victim straddled Bertrand while he performed the sacrifice of the mass. During this ceremony, Bertrand took sexual advantage of the victim. Bertrand ejaculated during the ceremony. After the ceremony, Bertrand told the victim that they had fulfilled the second holiest sacrifice next to Jesus and Mary on Calvary. During the blasphemous ritual, Bertrand elevated the consecrated host before Rachel's nude body, instructing her this is how she would receive the Eucharist from now on. He indicated that next time, he wanted Rachel to receive the host in the most blasphemous way possible, defiling and desecrating the sacrament through a sexual act. He afterwards told her what happened between them was so mystical, no one else would understand it, so they must not talk about it. According to my exorcist, I was being groomed specifically for a satanic black mass ritual. And um, Father Bertrand brought me right up to the very edge. I mean, if you want to think of it as like dress rehearsal, it was almost like he brought me to the very, very edge. And uh, by the grace of Mary, Our Lady, I was not actually fully sucked in because this, this satanic black mass would have served as a point of initiation into the occult. Church Militant spoke with the exorcist who helped Rachel. We're keeping him anonymous to protect his ministry. He was very sneaky, very sly in the way he presented things to her, particularly on her vulnerability. I have no doubt in my mind that where he was moving was toward a black mass where he would have violated her completely and then set her up in his coven for some very awful things he had planned for her. The exorcist would eventually help deliver Rachel from severe demonic oppression through a series of deliverance prayer sessions. Occult spirits are usually sent or summoned, so in this case, it was because a ritual that took place. It was a blasphemous ritual, blaspheming the Holy Mass, blaspheming the Holy Eucharist, certainly blaspheming the Holy Priesthood of our Lord. These particular demons only attach if they're summoned in an occult ritual, confirming to the exorcist that Father Bertrand was not simply a sexual predator, but a Satanist. Priesthood is not about power, but there is great power in the priesthood. There are a lot of people who enter the priesthood for their own reasons. They're looking for power. And somebody who's a Satanist, that's what they're looking for. That's all they're interested in, power. He was also grooming me to recruit priests into this dark enterprise. So there was also that component. You know, after, after the, the initiation, my exorcist believes I would have begun to actually draw priests into this satanic, um, dark sort of ring. In a case like Rachel, the intent was going to be, in taking away her virginity, it was to consecrate her and her sexuality to the evil. That's where their virginity became so important. If she would lose her virginity in an evil way, that would give profound power to them, but also to what they wanted to do with her. My exorcist believes that I was being recruited for a, a specific uh, position, kind of like a, a queen bee or a high priestess role. Uh, he didn't see me, I wasn't being recruited as, as, a, as like a virgin sacrifice. In a December 2011 phone call, Bertrand warned Rachel, the devil tempts me to think that you will tell someone and ruin my ministry. He also paid her hush money, saying God had told him to send her $1,000 for her studies. It wasn't until 2012, when she confided to a friend what had happened, that the scales fell from her eyes, and she began to realize who Bertrand really was.
Newly married and living in Raleigh, North Carolina at the time, Rachel reported her grooming and assault to the Diocesan Office of Child and Youth Protection. The director, Dr. John Pendergrass, took official notes, including details of the satanic ritual grooming and sexual assault during the blasphemous masses. Those notes were forwarded to the San Diego Diocese in 2014 and received by the Apostolic Administrator, Monsignor Stephen Callahan. So Monsignor Callahan received the report and then he actually called my perpetrator into the office and presented him with the report. Bertrand confessed. He confessed to Callahan once he read the report and it was detailed. It went into the rituals. It was very, very detailed. And this is the revolution. Up to that point, Father Bertrand had been busy in San Diego as a parish priest with a devoted following, devising creative ways to evangelize. Oh, hey, Merry Christmas. Amen. Jesus is the reason for the season. Giving theology on tap talks. Begin with some prayer. Uh, I'll also bless your food and I'll intend my blessing to bless whatever is outside of your stomach and what's inside as well in case you forgot. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And appealing to the youth, in particular, young women. We're, we're here. <laughs> His homilies seemed solid. When we know Jesus through our faith, we are inspired to be bold. No one suspected anything. But after confessing his ritual abuse to Monsignor Callahan, Bertrand took a leave of absence, the diocese allowing him to lie about the reasons, Bertrand claiming he had PTSD from a past arson attack at the church. I became aware that I struggled with experiencing emotional connectivity to the events as they unfolded. I have requested from Monsignor Stephen Callahan a leave of absence to address these matters. A few months later, Bertrand would announce his reinstatement to ministry. I have made the decision to be moved to another assignment after long prayer and discernment. One month after that, San Diego would receive a new bishop, Robert McElroy, who would play a major role in protecting the satanic priest. Culture of communion, participation, and mission. It is a grave wound in the life of the church. The new bishop for the Catholic Church in San Diego said in a response to a question that the issue of abuse by priests is something the church is still wrestling with. This has been the great tragedy of the church. In the a former auxiliary bishop in San Francisco, McElroy quickly made his mark in San Diego as one of the most heterodox bishops in the church. Among his first acts, counseling Catholic voters to stop using mortal sin as a gauge for political issues, calling that approach simplistic and thus misleading. This is the magisterial teaching of Pope Francis. In 2019, McElroy sided with leftist Chicago Cardinal Blaise Supich in insisting abortion should not be named the preeminent issue in the bishop's voting guide. It is not Catholic teaching that abortion is the preeminent issue that we face as a world in Catholic social teaching. It is not. While the bishops ultimately uh, shot down McElroy's proposal, as many as 69 much. voted alongside him to replace the wording. McElroy continued undermining Catholic teaching by claiming in 2019 that climate change is on par with abortion going even farther the next year in saying climate change has a greater death toll than abortion. But it was Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano's bombshell 2018 testimony, revealing a ring of complicit clergy who protected homosexual predator Cardinal Theodore McCarrick that put the pieces of the puzzle in place. The appointment of McElroy in San Diego was also orchestrated from above, with an encrypted peremptory order to me as nuncio, by Cardinal Perelin. Reserve the see of San Diego for McElroy. McElroy was also well aware of McCarrick's abuses, as can be seen from a letter sent to him by Richard Seip on July 28, 2016. The cover-up, the switching around, uh, the denial. Seip was instrumental in helping the Boston Globe blow wide open the church sex abuse scandals in 2002. And in 2018, 
Church Militant was among the first to report that McElroy had ignored abuse allegations against McCarrick when he received a letter from Sipe two years earlier detailing the Cardinal's abuse. I have interviewed 12 seminarians and priests who attest to propositions, harassment, or sex with McCarrick, who has stated, I do not like to sleep alone. One priest incarnated in McCarrick's Archdiocese of Newark was taken to bed for sex and was told, this is how priests do it in the U.S. None so far has found the ability to speak openly at the risk of reputation and retaliation. The system protects its impenetrability with intimidation, secrecy, and threat. Clergy and laity are complicit. McElroy's response? He ignored it and refused to meet further with Sype. When the McCarrick revelations erupted two years later, followed by the Summer of Shame, McElroy tried to save face by claiming he had thought they were just rumors. In further attempts to salvage his reputation, McElroy held a series of listening sessions in his diocese with the purported aim of allowing frustrated Catholics to air their grievances. Those listening sessions turned out to be a farce, heavily patrolled by armed security who intimidated attendees, who said it felt like prison, with those who dared to challenge the bishop thrown out. Why are you removing me? Why, why are you removing me? Why? 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 This includes a 15-year-old girl filming her father, a sex abuse victim, airing his grievances against McElroy for ignoring the McCarrick revelations. Don't touch me. Then leave, or we will place you under arrest. I'm 15. You can still be placed under arrest. You need to leave. This is private property. I've been blessed to have a bishop who is so supportive of me. I often text him and say, oh my God, Francis, better not move you somewhere else because who knows what could come down the line. And Among I, objections McElroy received at one listening session was his protection of a controversial figure, Aaron Bianco, a same-sex married man whom the bishop promoted as pastoral associate at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church. Bianco conducted a reign of terror over faithful parishioners, locking out the Legion of Mary, forcing them to pray the rosary in the parking lot. He also started heavily promoting New Ways Ministry, a dissident LGBT outreach condemned by the Vatican. When Church Militant reported on Bianco's misdeeds in 2018, he retaliated by reporting us to the Michigan Attorney General for so-called hate crimes against LGBT. The AG, Dana Nessel, a lesbian in a gay marriage, launched an investigation only to close it after several months after finding no evidence of a crime. Everyone in the diocese is scared of Bianco, said parishioner Adrian Jessen. They all know that whatever he says goes due to his closeness to McElroy and Dolan. That's then Father John Dolan, at the time pastor of St. John the Evangelist. Dolan already had a relationship with Bertrand. When Dolan served as his priest mentor at Bertrand's first assignment at St. Rose of Lima Parish in Chula Vista. There, Bertrand tried to groom another young woman using similar tactics he used on Rachel. To protect her identity, we'll use the alias Diane. From Diane's 2017 police report, Bertrand also became her spiritual director, confessor, and close personal friend. She and Bertrand read each other's journals. She said that one time Bertrand heard her confession in a car, and he told her he was not a virgin and talked about his sex life before he was a priest. She noticed the hugs would get longer. She said Bertrand encouraged her to become a nun. He would interview her dates, tell her how to kiss, and demonstrate on his hand. Bertrand reportedly bragged about his sexual misdeeds, according to one former NAC seminarian who spoke with Church Militant. In Bertrand's first year as a priest, he came back to Rome to visit the NAC. While visiting us at the NAC, he bragged about being accused of sexual misconduct. He explicitly shared the allegations. Allegedly, a young woman was asked to bend over so that he could check her vagina to see if her menstrual period had bled through her pants. That was Diane. She confirmed directly with Church Militant that the incident did indeed happen and that Father Dolan knew about it. She added that Bertrand actually engaged in several lengthy sexual conversations with her, trying to find out if she was a virgin. As mentioned, Bishop McElroy, 
after Bertrand had already confessed to taking sexual advantage of Rachel during Mass, reinstated him to priestly ministry in 2015, sending him to St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church, the same place he would send Father Dolan and Aaron Bianco. You're adorable. Yes, you are. Today, Dolan is a bishop, newly installed in Phoenix, Arizona. At his installation mass, sitting directly behind him, McElroy. And just behind him, L.A. Cardinal Roger Mahoney, whose archdiocese paid the largest sex abuse settlement in U.S. history, two-thirds of a billion dollars as a result of Mahoney's decades of cover-up of sexual predation. Bertrand's parish housekeeper also witnessed disturbing behavior. From a June 2017 police report, shortly after Bertrand arrived, the housekeeper noticed the sheets on Bertrand's bed were covered in semen stains. She offered to purchase new sheets for Bertrand, but he refused. Bertrand did nothing to hide the sheets from her. She reports that during a December 2013 Knights of Columbus event, as she was helping to unplug a toilet in the men's room, a male parishioner took photos of her from behind while she was bent over and sent them to Jacob Bertrand. He never told her. She endured six months of sexual harassment and gossip, including from Bertrand, and reported him to the diocese. While packing up his room in December 2014, she came across three or four leather-bound journals. Paging through the books to learn what they were, she discovered several written confessions with the names of teenagers on them. In 2015, she wrote her final letter to Bertrand, airing her grievances against him, including, Women, leaving your residence in the early morning hours. I know and have seen things that no one else has. As you step up on the altar to participate in Father's Day Mass, you will remind me of how hypocritical you are you make a mockery of the priesthood. The housekeeper spoke with Church Militant, confirming all the details. But she wasn't the only witness of bad behavior. A woman who spoke with us relayed the details of her friend's confession to Bertrand. In February of 2011, my friend asked to go to confession with Father Jacob Bertrand at St. Rose of Lima in Chula Vista. At the time, my friend was in high school and was secretly wrestling with his sexual orientation. Father Jacob took him to the sacristy and ordered him to get down on his knees while this sick priest stood over him. This teenage boy was forced to confess his sins directly in front of Father Jacob Bertrand's crotch. Then Father Jacob put his hands over my kneeling friend's head in order to absolve him. My friend recalls that this experience of absolution was very suggestive of oral sex. In 2016, Frustrated by the diocese's inaction, learning that Bertrand was still victimizing others, Rachel finally went to the police in Minnesota. It quickly led to the launch of a criminal prosecution. Well, a San Diego priest is facing sexual conduct charges here in Minnesota. He's accused of having sexual conduct with a woman during a private mass. But even then, knowing Bertrand was guilty, McElroy conducted a campaign of dissimulation refusing to disclose Bertrand's admission of misconduct, stonewalling the investigator from the prosecutor's office, and refusing to cooperate with law enforcement, all in an effort to conceal the satanic priest's crimes. When she filed, uh, the, uh, went to the authorities, uh, they contacted the Diocese of uh, San Diego that refused to turn over documents regarding uh, Bertrand. Jean Gamolka, a former Navy chaplain who now devotes his time to victim advocacy, spoke to Church Militant about McElroy's cover-up. They obviously uh, recognized that by allowing him as a sexual predator who raped uh, uh, Rachel to have left him in ministry, perhaps would open them up to uh, uh, charges of criminal omission from a 2018 Wall Street Journal article. The Diocese of San Diego refused to turn over key files. The attorney for the San Diego Diocese originally told us that they had no file related to an investigation involving Jacob Bertrand's alleged sexual acts with the victim in our case, which we later learned was false. 
and initially told the attorney from our office handling this prosecution that even if a file existed, they would not provide it. I remember, Chad, the, the, the criminal investigator calling me and saying, who do these people think they are? They're refusing to work with me. And I, all, the, they're, all they're doing is stonewalling me. All they're doing is completely reject. They're not letting, they're not letting me you know, investigate any of this. Why? I think um, all sides need to be careful. Bertrand also hired a defense attorney, Krista Groshek, who smeared Rachel as a liar. They're fanciful. These are false allegations. They're suspect. Um, the woman behind them has a motive. Our investigation has revealed the, the truth behind it. Uh, Father Bertrand is a young, reputable priest. Um, he's worked in large parishes in Southern California. And Bertrand sent a private investigator, Marie Little, to harass and intimidate Rachel at her home. Turns out Little has a criminal record, busted in 2015 after evidence she smuggled drugs to her love interest in prison, gang member Terrell Bell, serving 18 years for murder. The prosecution dragged on until 2018, just as Rachel was packing her bags to travel back to Minnesota for the start of criminal trial, she received a call from the prosecutor's office. And Heather Pippenhagen Pe calls me and says, <laughs> Kellyanne just called and he admitted that Bertrand admitted guilt all the way back in 2014. Kellyanne just threw him under the bus right at the last minute. And uh, Heather Pippenhagen could not believe what she was hearing, that he just threw in the towel, threw him under the bus at the last minute, and we had an admission of guilt. This was, you know, basically, uh, it was a slam dunk. That admission of guilt resulted in a plea bargain, with Bertrand agreeing to plead guilty to criminal sexual conduct in exchange for avoiding jail time, instead getting supervised probation for 10 years. Among the conditions, do not engage in spiritual advice or counseling, you cannot be alone with any females in any organizational settings for whom you have supervisory authority. McElroy uh, was complicit in covering for um, the man who raped me within this context of the holy sacrifice of the mass. This is this is egregious. It's, it's, it's horrible. And uh, it begs the question, what are you hiding? Today, Bertrand is no longer a priest. He's married with children and running Metropolitan Realty in San Diego. He's also reportedly active at The Rock Church, an evangelical megachurch. Although convicted of a sex crime, he's not named in the San Diego diocesan list of credibly accused priests. Why? Because he didn't abuse a minor. McElroy also continues to deny wrongdoing with the help of the LA Archdiocese. One layman recently wrote to Archbishop Jose Gomez asking that he launch a formal investigation into McElroy's cover-up of the ritual abuse. Instead, he got this email from lay staffer Dr. Heather Banis. I learned that the matter you referenced was investigated and addressed such that Jacob Bertrand was laicized. Bishop McElroy participated in that process and fully discharged his responsibilities in the matter. Church Militant contacted Bishop McElroy, asking him specifically why he reinstated Bertrand to priestly ministry after knowing he was guilty of abusing Rachel during Mass. His spokesman, Kevin Eckery, evaded the question, simply writing, Jacob Bertrand was removed from ministry by the diocese and later laicized. We played no role and did not assist in his criminal defense. Beyond that, there is little more I can say. In spite of the darkness that engulfed Rachel's life for years as a result of this satanic priest and his protectors, her story has a happy ending. It was the most, uh, my, I mean, my husband was in the room just sobbing. It was, it was something that you can't, there's nothing, there's no movie. There's no, there's nothing that can even explain what that was until you witness uh, someone who was in the grips of such evil that, that for them to experience a total liberation. It was a, it was a moment from heaven. It was a heavenly moment. On the Solemnity of the Assumption 2020, during the final deliverance prayer session with her exorcist, after hours of what Rachel describes as excruciating demonic combat, Our Lady appeared and crushed the head of the serpent. She crushed 
Satan. And I mean, I, I, I could feel her heel crushing my head. It wasn't me, but it was the enemy, which was, which had, uh, which was afflicting me that, that the, the, the exorcist brought forth and, and forced to manifest the moment that, that, that our lady, that our lady, her heel crushed him is, is one of the most victorious moments of my, of my whole life. And now I live to tell of Mary. Now I live to, I mean, consider everything going on in the church. Like the church is being uh, diabolically, some would even maybe say possessed. There's like a, a diabolical, uh, something really evil going on uh, in the bride of Christ. And, and I believe that Our Lady, she, you know, she, her heart will triumph and the, and, and, and the bride of Christ will be restored. Christine Niles, Church Militant, Detroit.